All right. Well, we are here on this Monday evening. Uh, everybody is safe and snug in their isolated environments uh, during this, this, this challenge that we're going through. But I want to thank everyone for, for logging on, uh, coming on so that we can have this chat. And I just so appreciate all of my friends uh, that have connected with me from far and wide. And um, we want to welcome all of our, our viewers out there, our listeners, whatever they're called, and uh, Jim can correct me on that, whatever they're called. But we, we, we're really glad that people have, have logged in to listen to this conversation. And, and just so, um, just to clarify, it, it's a conversation among friends. Uh, everyone on this call is a, a burn survivor and had had some experiences uh, with the burn uh, injury that's very similar to what people are feeling now in the world with this um, this virus going on. And we just want to get on here and, and, and kind of talk about that, talk through it. And I want to make it clear that this time that we're spending here is not designed to fix anyone. We're hoping through this dialogue and what people have to share on this line, someone will find some benefit for it. And hopefully uh, at the end of this, someone would be a little bit inspired as we continue to work through this pandemic and we will work through it. And I think that anytime we can encourage one another, that's what it's gonna to take to get through this. It's not just finding a vaccine, but it's really encouraging one another. And I'll start with introducing myself before you guys uh, introduce yourself. And I'm Dennis Garden, uh, Dennis J. Garden, and I'm the executive director of the Georgia Firefighters Burn Foundation. Uh, but more than that, I'm, I'm Dennis, a burn survivor. And I'm Dennis, a father. I'm Dennis, a brother. I'm Dennis, a friend. And um, and I'm just so honored to be here sharing this format with some very, very dear friends. And I'll give them an opportunity to introduce themselves. And uh, we can start with you, Jim. Start with me? Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is James Bosch. And I'm um, dialing in, zooming in to you from um, San Diego, California. Um, I am also a burn survivor. I was burned when I was an infant um, by hot water, crawled injury, and um, I've been working in some capacity either as a volunteer or professional in the burn community for about 25 years now. Um, I'm currently a, a marriage and family therapist that I do a lot of work with trauma survivors here in California. And I also do um, contract work with the Phoenix Society um, helping them with their emotional support needs and groups. And um, I'm also very involved with the Burn Foundation here in California. So, um, but most importantly, like Dennis says, I'm a, a friend of these people um, on this screen right here. And um, happy to be here just to have this discussion about how to get through any kind of hard time. And um, this, this time is affecting people very differently. Um, and um, and yeah, so I'm interested in the conversation and getting my friends' perspectives and maybe sharing a little of mine. Mm -hmm. Thank you, James. Uh, Diane. Hello. All right. Well, I am Cheyenne. Um, I'm calling in from Atlanta. Um, I, too, am a burn survivor. Um, I was burned when I was three years old by hot grease. 50% um, of my body, third and fourth degree burns. Um, I initially got involved with the Burn Foundation when I was five years old. Um, I started with the Burn Foundation as a camper, and from there, um, worked all the way up to volunteer. Um, since then, I tried to work with the Foundation with whatever it is that I can, can do, just volunteering or helping with whatever I can. Um, I've attended a few conferences, so that's been great. Um, I also have a podcast, um, Unapologetically Shy, um, and it's not necessarily just for burn survivors. Um, it's for anyone who may be um, has dealt with some sort of trauma or um, is overcoming something. And I, I like to bring people on my show to, of course, talk about the struggles or trauma or things that they've been through to kind of normalize it because um, mental health is not something that um, is frequently talked 
about enough. Um, so that's really my hopes with this podcast is to inspire people and to let people know that, you know, everyone goes through things and everyone, there's no little or big. Um, everyone has um, something that they go through and I just want everyone to be comfortable to be able to share those things. So yeah, so that's, that's much feel you guys. <laughs> Great, great. And the, the world friend is in much love, O.J. Harris, if you would. Hey, everybody. This is O.J. Harris, also known as, as Aurelius. Um, I am coming by the way of Los Angeles, California. I have been a part of the burn community ever since I was 11, year old, uh, 11 years old when I started to come to um, the burn survivor camp that's put on by the GFBF. Um, me and my family were in the house explosion when I was three years old. And of course, um, ever since that experience and growing up with the bird uh, survivor community, I had a passion for um, not only bird survivors, but all kinds of different survivors in, um, in all different kinds of communities. And that's what has brought me here today to share my journey and to let people know that the journey is never really over. And this is just a piece of our journey. And we have to take account of that and look forward to the future and to the next steps. Great, great, great. And last but certainly not least is uh, Cindy Rudder. Or can I call you Cindy Poo on here, Cindy, or does it need to be Cindy? You can call me Cindy Poo. You okay. can. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm honored to be here with uh, four other people that I consider great friends. Um, like everybody else, a burn survivor for many years, like 60 and counting, and um, been involved in the burn community for many years. And I just, um, in different capacities, as a former nurse manager of the burn unit here in San Diego, and following in my dear friend James's footsteps to become a marriage family therapist, and I feel like at this particular time, we're all going through tough times and just being able to get on this and see each other's faces is powerful. And hopefully anybody that's listening in also recognizes that if they want to type a question, we'll try to address those as we go along. And hopefully some of the stuff we talk about will resonate with you. And you can take that on this journey that we're all on, but maybe it'll help you on the journey. So I'm honored to be here with each one of you. And let me say how this this this, this conversation even evolved, uh, where it was born from. Having a couple of conversations with with friends within the burn survivor community, and talking about isolation, talking about social distancing, talking about fear, anxiety, hopelessness. And it was very interesting to me hearing that, that right now we have this, this COVID virus, this COVID-19, and, it's, and it's, it's attacking the world. And people are attaching these emotions to it. And it was very interesting. I was having a couple of conversations, and it was very interesting that these were the feelings that I was experiencing as a burn survivor in my journey. Um, and I got burned as a 14 year old and grew up with the physical difference and grew up with all the challenges that are associated with being burned. And when we talk about isolation, uh, social distancing, lack of contact, isolation, hopelessness, everyone on this call was burned as, as children and are now adults. Have any of you guys experienced any of that in your journey long before the virus came and the reason I want to talk about it is because I think there's a sense now that people are attaching all of these things to this, what I call an alien monster, that's this virus. And the reality is um, a lot of these feelings and emotions were around before the virus came and they would be around when we get through the virus. And speaking for myself, um, I hid in the house for two years after getting out of the hospital as a 14 year old because I look different. And now we have the government telling us to stay in. But when I was a kid coming up, I stayed in the house for two years because it was that voice in my head telling me that I needed to stay in because I didn't know what the future held for me. And Jim, you and I were talking the other day and when you told me that things occur that connect you, not necessarily to what's happening now, but it can connect us to a past trauma. 
and if anybody wants to respond to that, uh, the floor the floor is yours. But it really resonated with me, Jim, when you talked about connecting to a past trauma. And I mean, I think I that, what that means. The thing that I was relating at that time was this feeling of um, being trapped. You know, we, this sense of being trapped in place. Um, you know, when I in many burn survivors I've talked to relate to the same experience. You know, when I was at burned, I was eight months old, and uh, I was burned um, more than the third degree burns you see. My whole body was burned, and then it took a while for the second and third, and whatever, to, to just for them to know. So I was bandaged. Um, I had a doctor at that time was doing early excision grafting, which wasn't, you know, it was kind of cutting edge. So I had surgeries right away. And um, so, you know, this is later through the personal development work that I figured this out is that, um, you know, I was an infant bandage strapped down to a, a crib so I wouldn't pull my grafts and bandages off. And I was in a space where um, talking to my mother, you know, where the crib was, you know, had a net over the top so I wouldn't get out. And she had to leave it at eight o'clock every night. So I didn't have like now where family can stay and nurture and that attachment can happen. So, you know, it's like that sense of being trapped. What is that feeling? You know, we may feel it in different ways in our lives and relationships and whatever, jobs and places. So does that live in your body, in my body from the time of that trauma in some way? And can it be triggered? That's kind of, you know, so now we're kind of trapped inside um, as much as we're supposed to be. And, um, and I think too, that for me, there's a sense of my life hasn't changed that much because I work a lot from home anyways. I found a lot of social ways to connect with people, all the Zoom meetings and Zoom connections, and Zoom happy hours and Zoom CrossFit and Zoom meditation meeting. Like I'm Zooming, I'm Zooming all over the place. But, um, but there's a sense of, strangeness outside when you go out and it's empty and the sirens or you go to the store and the meat locker's empty. There's this sense that I think activates a bit of my fight, flight, or freeze in the back of my mind, you know, and so it can activate. And I think that's what I was talking about with you is that feeling like I'm coping pretty well. My life, daily life is so different. Mm -hmm. But I know there's something really big happening in the world. I've chosen to isolate myself from uh, popular news and I just read scientific sources online because I was also getting my fight, flight, or freeze activated by the craziness in the news. Mm -hmm. So I think that's all happening and, and being and flying at us from every direction. And if we are have unresolved trauma or say we even have work on our trauma those old traumas of the brain, I think, are being activated. And um, that's what I was referring to. Can those, can those, those, those triggers, can they be activated and I not know it, I not be aware of it? That's what I'm saying. It's happening in the background of your mind. Mm -hmm. You're on edge. You're more anxious, um, more mm -hmm. depressed. Um, you, you, you're acting out in behaviors of, uh, that aren't maybe so healthy. Maybe you're not still, you know, maybe you're not stuck on, stuck at, uh, stocking up on toilet paper, but you own, you know, whiskey. I mean, so, I mean, different ways it could be coming out, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other thing I think that is going on as well, James, when you bring all of those triggers up, is when you think about when you're in the burn unit, when you've been burned, and the lack of control that you have, we you lose control right and so i think that's another factor that comes in during this time is we really have no control over what's going on right now nor and we can't change it we have to abide by what's being put out there and it may bring back for a lot of people the lack of control when you're in the hospital and even when you get out initially you know, you don't have control over what's going on in your life and you have to follow a regimen that's being told to you. And that's 
what we're doing at this point in time in our lives. And, you know, being someone that readily admits that I'm a little bit of a control freak, uh, a little, that is something that's been difficult for me that, well, I just want to go out and guess what? I can't. And so it kind of brings back all of that from when you're a child, you know, or when you were in the hospital. So that's just another factor. And, and you know, uh, control is really an illusion anyway. Yeah. But, but if I acknowledge that I don't have control, am I also acknowledging that I'm weak? Because sometimes when you say a thing, it becomes more real. Right. And that's the question for anyone on the panel. I don't think it indicates a weakness. I just think it um, indicates a frustration for me personally. Uh, I don't know what anybody else feels, but. And definitely, I can relate to that because I am a little bit of a control freak myself. So, so not, yeah, so not being able to go as I please or not being able to. Um, control the situation has definitely frustrated me. Um, and I think another thing um, that's kind of frustrated me too is when I have had to leave my house like a, a necessity, and that's really the only time I've tried to leave is if I absolutely needed to, um, is I've noticed that looking at me, and I don't know if that's just maybe something that I am mentally doing, well, if people really are looking at me, um, maybe thinking like, hmm, I wonder, you know, I see those marks on her face and things. Like, I wonder if she's sick. Or, you know, um, so that's definitely one thing that um, I think has triggered me a little bit as well. Um, and I, I've been trying to um, keep something in mind that um, Dennis actually told me, um, was that you never know why somebody is looking at you. Um, so just, I guess I've been trying to be mindful of that. Maybe they're not looking at me because they think I'm sick. Um, but it is a little bit frustrating. Now, do, do, do you have to know why a person's looking at you? Why is that um, important? Why, why does that not even come up? But you know, being a control freak um, <laughs> and yeah. wanting to know everything, um, it, it bothers me a little bit. Um, so I, I find myself going out less and less, even if I need to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, con control is a very, it, it's elusive and it's, it's, it's an illusion, but I, I think we're, we're very right. Right now, no one, and I shouldn't use a blanket indictment, but very few people feel in control right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Very few people. And, it, and it's interesting, having to self-isolate is very very interesting because i did it before in some ways i feel trapped when i could easily walk out my door you know and leave but i'm kind of feeling i have a legitimate excuse now because the television says i shouldn't and i think back when i was a kid and i was hiding in the house for two years nobody told me to hide but nobody forced me to come out either i mean i was i was encouraged by some language, some communication that wasn't honest. You know, when I would hear, it doesn't matter what people think about how you look. Well, hell, it mattered to me. And I knew people wanted to be supportive. And like right now with people going through fear and anxiety, and you know, we, we really do have a right to feel how we feel. And I think we just need to acknowledge that. And I saw you shaking your head, OJ. Um, what, what was that? <laughs> um shaking my head at the comment um we are allowed to feel what we feel um and i feel when we go out you know it all depends on what headspace we are in you know on how we feel about a certain look and i feel like with the self-isolation i feel that's going to heighten it once you do go out because you're not around people as much you know what i mean so you, when you do step out you may notice it a little more because it takes you out of your normal day-to-day -day routine exactly mm -hmm. guys there's a question from beverly and it says do you think that your experiences are helping you work through this situation now i say yes 100 um 
I think that people that have had some level of my personal experience is that people have had a level of adversity and have gone through things and have learned how to cope are doing better than people that haven't in some ways. Um, I think about the, um, the large 12-step um, communities, AA and NA and OA and all these different um, Al-Anon. I mean, I, those people have been through a lot and they've also had a lot of training in accepting the things they cannot change, <laughs> changing the things they can and having the wisdom that like in living a day at a time, trying not to use their thing of choice. So I feel like I was laughing, I said, they were the first group to get their Zoom meetings online. I mean, they were like, we, we got this. And um, so I feel that, um, I really feel that people that have been through some stuff are coping a little better because you, you have reference points of how you've gotten through things, at least um, that's what I've noticed. Mm -hmm. I would agree. I would definitely say that my past experiences are helping me with this. Um, I think anyone that faces adversity and learning how to journey through that um, and this is a time of adversity, really. And so, yeah, I would, to your question, Beverly, I definitely think this is helping me get through this. And, and I think reflecting back on my experiences. Dennis, can you hear you? Reflecting back on my experiences, uh, it, it helps me manage a lot of things. Um, the other morning, I like to say I, I jog every morning, but actually I walk. <laughs> And my morning walk through the park the other morning, it was such a lonely experience because walking through the park, people are out, they've got their dogs. Can I pet your dog? Sure you can. You know, you, you stop, you're talking. And I was out walking the other morning in the park and no one was talking to each other. And walking down the sidewalk, people were stepping off the sidewalk to maintain at least that six feet of distance and I was like, I'm still smiling. Hey, how you doing? I'm still who I am, but I wasn't gonna let it take me off the, I'm not walking in the mud, I'm, I'm sorry. But what it, it made me reflect on was it's like, wow, this is what people used to do to me because I look different, you know? And it wasn't because people were mean or nasty, they were afraid and didn't understand. So now here are people, and it's like, there was, I'll be honest, there was some satisfaction found that it wasn't just me, it was happening to everybody who was in the park, you know, and I should be ashamed to say that, but I'm being honest, it was happening, it's like, okay, you guys get it now, you know, this is what I've dealt with and what I've had to deal with in my life because of my appearance, and like I said, people can't be judged by what they do always, but just like my different physical appearance, these burn scars, People don't understand them, so they're afraid of it. This virus, people don't understand it, and they're afraid of it. And it's just so many parallels to just, and not just burns, it's whatever we're going through in life, you know, but we happen to be a community of burn survivors. And I just think it's really healthy to have this conversation because people are afraid. You know, uh, at the grocery store just the other day, I was parking and there was a gentleman and his son who looked like he was about seven or eight years old and they were putting their groceries in the car. So as I'm getting out of the car and they've got masks and gloves and the little boy started pushing the buggy back towards the store. And I said, hey, young man, I'm going in, I'll grab the buggy. And he looked at me in fear. And he said, no, mister, I can't give you this buggy because they haven't wiped it down yet. I can't give it to you. And he started walking away from me real fast. And I was like, wow, the, the, the level of fear, you know, checking out of the grocery store. I just asked the cashier, I said, how's it going? I said, it's a little crowd, more crowded than I thought it was. How's it going for you to handle it? And she just looked at me and she said, I am so afraid. And she started crying at the cash register. And it was like, oh my, oh my God, oh my God. The people are just trying to manage it, you know? So if through my past experience to help me deal with this, sure. <laughs> on a lot of levels because of the parallels. Mm -hmm. If you sneeze or cough, you're in trouble. If you're yes. out, it's yeah. very interesting. Or if somebody, I know for me, if I'm out, which I haven't been a lot, I promise, but when I am, if somebody sneezes or coughs, it kicks me into a frenzy. Uh -huh. 
I, I feel like that's one thing for me that is also kind of triggered me a little bit is the what if I do get sick like what if what if something does happen to me you know I think about I've already been in the hospital one time before you know for you know a serious reason and was in the hospital for a really long time mm -hmm. like god forbid I get sick like what, what then I think that's kind of like I'm, I'm gonna be right back where I was um and that hospital is scared um and I think the I don't I don't know it's just it kind of freaks me out a little bit <laughs> just a little bit mm -hmm. and, and, and I don't know a lot of people that are more of a social butterfly than OJ and I'm just wondering having to turn that porch light off you know and <laughs> and put the brakes on your social life and what, what's that like for you you know it's one thing to turn it off because you're tired it's entirely another thing to turn it off because the world has come to a screeching halt. It has been very different just because, you know, I like you say, I am a social butterfly. So I do like to be out with friends and at a lunch or at dinner or around people. So it, it's just different. It's just to not have that that face to face contact is just. I don't know, I, it, it has me in a place of of feeling really lonely, even though, you know, I'm not really alone in all of this because it's a world issue. It just makes you feel like, dang, you know what I mean? I I miss people. I miss that surrounding of having that community and going out and having my sense of normalcy. And then it's just been snatched. It's just been taken away. And it's just, it leaves you like, well, what do I do? You know, now with my time and you just have to, what I've been doing personally is just doing those little things to keep me on, on a daily schedule, you know, get up, you know, still make my bed, you know, keep on a, not the same schedule I was before, but my new normal schedule and to try to stay active and reach out via face, you know, FaceTime, Zoom and have that conversation or, you know, or text a little bit. But, but now I'm trying to transition more into having that, um, that phone call conversation that we have gotten so far away from now. And I, and I know, I've, I've known you uh, most of your life, and I remember conversations we've had over the years about how lonely your childhood was going to school, you know, and how some of the rejection you experienced when you were in school. Does, does some of that resonate now, or do you think about that a little bit more now going through this isolation? Oh, for sure. Just because, uh, you know, when going through it in school, you know, you always, you felt left out, you know. And you felt like nobody wanted to be around you and nobody, you know what I mean? Like you just did not fit in. And so now it's it's not the same feeling, but it's it's very similar because you want to be it's, you still want to be in the in crowd, you still want to go, but you can't, you know what I mean? It's, and now because it's not it's not available now, is we can't, you know, for safety reasons. And even going to the grocery store, I, you know, I was burning most, uh, mostly my hands and my arms. And so the touching, you know, people's hands with exchanging money, you know, when I was younger, people would, or still to today, they would, you know, put, sit it on the counter instead of putting it in my hand. And I laughed the other day in the store because the guy, he put the receipt in my cash on the, on the counter so fast. And I was like, in my head, I was like, oh, rude. But then I was just like, and then I had to think about it, and I was like, okay, he's wearing gloves, he has on a mask, he's doing this for protection. And then I thought about it, and I was like, well, if you, I had, you know, when you're not used to that, you know what I mean? It makes you feel a certain type of way, you know what I mean? I had been coming accustomed to, it hadn't happened in a while. So it was just, it just had took me right back to that feeling of, oh, he didn't want to touch my hand. Like, what's wrong with me? Why can't you, you know, exchange this? this money or this money or receipt with me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. And, that, and that's, that's very interesting how that occurs. And I don't know if it's less painful, somebody, because I've had experienced that a lot too, people putting money on the counter and not wanting to make contact with my hand. And I'm just wondering, is it less painful because it's that thing over there and not me where I can kind of separate myself from the rejection, if that makes any sense. 
Yeah. See, though, I, I had to separate myself from the rejection because I had to realize in that moment that he couldn't get And guess what? And, and maybe not. Just in, in my head, I did just for the fact of, of the, you know, what's going on. I was, I associated it with that instead of associated it with the burns, which, you know, if this wasn't going on, I definitely would have it associated with the burns, you know. Just about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, anyway. what are some other things, though, that that you guys are doing to accommodate the feeling of isolation? Staying busy. In what way, though? Mm -hmm. Like when you say staying busy. So I have decided to just rearrange and reorganize my entire house. Right. Uh, started on projects that. I should have probably done months ago, but didn't get done. So that's what I'm doing now. Um, I guess the fortunate thing for me is like I, I work from home for the most part, um, unless of course I've got a guest that's coming on the show. Um, but I part of my other job is I make things. So I make like crafts and stuff and sell them online. Um, so I've just been consuming myself with that as much as possible, um, even if I don't have orders to fulfill, just doing the work, just to have extra inventory. Um, and I, th I think another thing though with the work thing though is I've had so many people that I've wanted to get on the schedule for, for interviews and things like that um, for my podcast. So that's been kind of driving me crazy right now. Um, so I've been trying to, I guess, get inspired by myself. I don't know. <laughs> but that's about it. Journaling, yeah. that helps. You, um, that I've been staying very busy. And, um, you know, I usually work from home a certain number of days and I work in an office the other days and I've transitioned all that to at home. And um, I... Um, but I have a very full schedule. And then I also, you know, like you said, like trying to do things more mindful, and like spend more time, getting, you know, I have, I've really been trying to work on a meditation practice and that is something I'm working on and it's great. And then also um, like intentionally doing things, like I cleaned my apartment yesterday, but I did it with intention. Like I did it like, Okay, I'm doing the floors. I'm doing the floors. That's all I'm doing right now is I'm cleaning my floors. Like it's almost like a med you know, like stuff like that, like really spending time. And then um projects. You know, I'm an artist, so I've I've been working on projects and um and um staying really connected with people via technology and um and also catching up on my shows that I've been behind on because I'm <laughs> Because I'm usually running around at night. So, uh, so yeah, so a I little bit of that too. I have to say, like OJ said, it's actually kind of nice not to just be texting people, but now it's like you want that interaction of hearing their voice and talking to people on the phone, um, which is mm -hmm. great. Um, James and I were talking, I think it was last week, and I'm a little OCD and he wanted to know if I had already gone through every cabinet and every closet in my house and I have. So I think, you know, that's getting more organized than I already am is keeping me busy too. <laughs> so um, not a bad thing though, because I think the alternative, if we sit idle and ruminate, um, it can be really detrimental. You know, we can all really fall down a, a slippery slope during these times. And I do think it can take us back to those days of feeling, you know, very alone as a burn survivor. So I, I, I think the things that people are able to do that keep them busy, whatever it may be, exercise, um, whatever, I think it's, a positive thing to to look you know at different things that you can do to keep your mind and your body busy I think I'm lonely in the park in the morning right <laughs> um, but, but the challenge for me is taking advantage of this time 
and not doing anything. You know, um, because there's nothing I have to do, and that's a real struggle for me because it's just my motor is always running, and I have to really put energy into just sitting down and just being, you know, because there's always something to do. And then the reality, now we're in a place where we can't do it, and and then it, it, and it's okay. So for me, it's really, and I said, I, I said, this is my opportunity to watch a lot of movies that I've been wanting to watch. I've got all these movies saved on my playlist to watch, and I got about 20 movies saved, because that's, when I go in to watch a movie, I just look for more movies to save because I'm not going to sit for two hours and watch a movie. But here, like, I, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> so I really can. So the challenge for me is just to not do anything and just be still. And I think, I strongly believe that's going to benefit me tremendously once we get on the other side of this, uh, this, this thing, this pandemic that's going on. Yeah. <laughs> I really like it. Joni Wilson just said, um, that is the challenge, just not doing anything, downtime. You know, we're not, when you're used to being busy, it's hard to do nothing, but it's a good thing, right? To do nothing sometimes. Yes. Yes. I, I love that you guys brought that up because I am actually using my patio for like the first time since I've been here. Um, I never just sit out on my patio and just enjoy myself. Um, so I've been utilizing that topic of discussion for this particular conversation that we're having right now. Um, it makes me think of this thing that I saw online that said, um, when you can't go outside, go inside. Um, this kind of makes me think about um, reflection. Um, I'm all about self-reflection and just being able to be with yourself and having alone time. Um, and, or what have you, um, to just reflect on life. Um, I think that's definitely one of the biggest positives that have come out of this. Let me tell you, I have discovered a lot about myself over the course of the last couple of weeks. And I'm always, of course, you know, trying to reflect on self. And I'm always trying to um, gain new knowledge and things like that. Um, but I guess there's just something about almost being forced to stay inside now that has really forced me to go inside myself um, and focus on those things um, and it's been it's actually been very nice very refreshing to to put that energy into myself because um, I feel like I don't do that enough um, I, I've always my energy is always going to to other things and other people um, which of course I don't mind it you know but I think sometimes we forget to uh, take a break and, and, and take care of ourselves. So this is definitely a good time to, to do that. And hopefully would, 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 that you guys, would you guys find that's part of the challenge with being isolated? Because don't you find that, that people uh, have a fear of looking at themselves? <laughs> you know, don't we, don't we try to focus on everything else except ourselves? Because if I, if I really and truly look at myself and reflect on me and go inside, what if I don't like what I find? You know, so I can just stay as busy as I want to be. But now, what now? How many times can I mop the floor? You know, uh, <laughs> how many times can I rearrange the furniture? You know, how many times can I go sit on the deck? And just, and I'm not just talking about now, with what's going on now, but just don't people tend to have a tendency to be afraid to look at themselves? Yeah, I wish Coach was here right now. She would be probably beat me up right now. Um, I, I have a coach that I talk to like every Sunday. Um, and she point blank told me that you consume yourself with everybody else's life because you don't want to deal with your own. And that really, uh, <laughs> really hit me. Um, I was very mad at her for a couple of days for saying that to me because I'm just like, how dare you? How dare you say that? But um, of course, with a little self-reflection and um, you know, thinking about that and really listening to her words and what she was saying, I think that is very accurate that it's easy to get consumed with everything but you mm -hmm. um, what's going on in, in the world, just generally speaking. Um, I go, go ahead, Odette, I was say when she said she was pissed, 
at her at her coach. I was thinking about you, and uh, but go, go ahead. <laughs> um, you made me forget what I was going to say. Um, no, during this time, I think it's um, very important to have that conversation with yourself. You're not going anywhere. And I think it's very important to acknowledge that if, if you are at that space of not liking where you are, acknowledge it. But also, this is when the self-care comes into place. You know what I mean? Because that acknowledgement can bring things to life, but it also can bring clarity and it can bring positivity because now you've got it out there. But now, now that it's out there, now what can you do to change those things? What can you do to, 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 to take care of yourself, to uplift yourself, to make yourself feel better? So I think now is the time to say that. Say, so you know what? No, I am not feeling myself today. Cry it out, but know that tomorrow I'm gonna wake up and I'm gonna change it. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do something a, a different today. Because we also have to think about the people during this time who were depressed and sad before they got to this isolation place. Yeah. That's where my mind went when all this um, started was thinking about the people who were already in a dark place before this even began. And you know, where, where do they go now? Where, where's the hope coming from now? When now you are isolated, you don't, you can't, the little communication you did have with your friends and your family, you, you can't do that as much now. It's like, it's hard. Absolutely. I, and I think it's when you say um, that there are people who were probably depressed or going through things before this happened, I think this could also be kind of a shock to them, too, is like, with all the craziness and things that are, and I don't know if that's what you're getting at, but with all the craziness that goes on just in life, generally speaking, and coming now into this world, um, it could be a shock. Like, wow, like, I didn't even know that I was feeling this way. I didn't even know like what it was like to be alone by myself because I've never experienced this before. So it could definitely scare a lot of people. And I, I appreciate you for that perspective because I didn't even really, I didn't really think about that. Honestly, it's gotta be scary. And I, I was thinking about, um, not necessarily about mental health, but um, they were talking about um, children, a lot of children who go to school and, you know, school for them is, you know, a place to get away from their homes and they're able to have food to eat and things like that, whereas they don't have these things at home. And now they're stuck at home and they can't go anywhere and they don't have food to eat regularly and things like that, you know. So I think it's kind of a similar concept of what, yeah. at least what I yeah. what you just said. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, and Beverly just made a comment about, um, she heard that there was a, the suicide calls are up in a certain town and I think that that is very true about people that are already depressed and already have anxiety it it just makes sense that the depression would be increased and the anxiety would be increased by what's happening in the world right so I think it's really important to um, if you have people in your life that you know are prone to that to check in on them and make sure that they know who to call or what to do if things get really really intense um, you know, and I think that, you know, a lot of you guys brought up a good, a couple of really good points about, you know, some of us, some people like to be alone. Some people find isolation to be um, comfortable. Some people are isolated because they're afraid of the world and they don't know how to engage. Some people uh, stay busy out in the world because they're afraid to be with themselves, you know, so it's definitely bringing up a lot. And I think when you guys started the talk about control. And I think a lot of what I'm helping people do right now in my therapy practice is figure out what you have control of and what you don't, and then figure out what kind of tools that you, you already have and what you need. And it's like, um, you know, I'm finding there's so much generosity out there amongst the self-help um, online industry. They're opening up their programs for free. They're opening up their, their sites. They're, um, a lot of exercise and yoga places are giving, um, you know, opening up their online classes for free. So there's a lot of generosity and a lot of, like as AJ said, self-help uh, or self-care. I mean, um, there's a lot of resources that you know are available, and and, um, and if you find them, share them with your friends. You know, and the other last point I'll make is that um, 
at least in my world, there's a lot of people that have lost their jobs. And so where I'm putting my personal service work is in making sure those people are okay. Um, dropping on some Venmo if I have it, um, seeing what they need, um, checking in on them because it's scary. You know, you, you know, number of people I know went in in the service industry and we're just not told we're close, you're, you know, you're offered to, they're just, we're, you're fired or you're, you know, whatever, laid off. So it's, that's, you know, so it's a really intense time that way for people. So that's kind of how I'm trying to be in service. And that makes me feel good too. So. And, and, and with, with uh, one of the support groups that I've been involved with, um, the, the term was used, people ask for support, not because they're weak, but because they want to remain strong. And I think that's a very important uh, uh, point to make because uh, you guys as, as, as therapists, what you guys do, Jim, Cindy, um, you know, there was a stigma attached to getting some mental health help. You know, like if I go see a therapist, I'm acknowledging that I'm crazy, you know, and I'm already being looked at differently because of my physical appearance or what I've gone through. So I don't want to pile on top of that by people knowing that I'm crazy. Um, and, and, and how do you guys re respond to that? Because what I want to do um, as we're getting near the seven o'clock hour and we're talking about where the world is now, um, but you guys can kind of share uh, some nuggets about life after because this, this, this pandemic will end. And uh, I'm going to use uh, Cheyenne as an example. I remember Cheyenne as a as a as a child. One of the things that and and, and I'll ask for forgiveness later, Cheyenne, because I'm going to share this with the world. <laughs> um, <laughs> one of the things that Cheyenne, one of the things you used to really be concerned with when you were a kid growing up, were you ever going to have a boyfriend? And I remember how many conversations we had sitting by the campfire. Am I ever going to have a boyfriend? Will anybody ever want to? want to be with me and then fast forward where you reconnect with a childhood friend and you guys see each other and i'll never forget when you posted on facebook your your hand with the half a finger missing but your hand with that engagement ring on it you know and i could just reflect back on all your concern about a boyfriend but hell you got a husband and he's an amazing husband and and I share that to say, you were struggling with something and you came out on the other side, the story had a happy ending. And I believe that this story, when we tell this story about this pandemic, that it will have a happy ending. And I would like for you guys to each take an opportunity to share your happy ending to this thing. What's on the other side of this? Yeah, of course, I, I think for me, it's just um, being optimistic. Um, like you were talking about, um, I was always wondering, you know, when, when is this going to happen for me? When will it happen for me? Um, same kind of feeling fast forwarding now with what's going on is, you know, will this end, you know, how is this going to play out? Having questions like that. Um, I think it's really just, you got to be optimistic. I mean, you can't really, you can't just give up. Um, you know, that's one thing that I can, say I was actually just talking about this to my husband that you know a lot of the things that I've been through in life I never gave up and that was one thing that I can say is always been very consistent with me um it's just always trying to remember that there is another side to whatever it is that is going on um pain is only temporary um I think it's important too and I agree with you completely the optimism is key but I also um, feel it's important that we recognize that there are resources to help us with that. And that even like there's a lot of burn support groups that are online right now that people can reach out to. And the, the thing again, as far as um, mental health and recognizing that there is no weakness in reaching out for help as far as seeing a therapist or seeing a psychologist, whatever it is you need to do, that that certainly, actually to me, it indicates that there's some strength if you can reach out. 
and I recognize that like there are different groups doing the online support groups. And if that helps you and can get you through this, and like you, I am very optimistic that we're going to come out on the other side of this. We're going to come out stronger and better um, as human beings, because I do believe that it is giving us time for self-reflection. And so that, that's my hope and not giving up hope, you know, believing that we're going to be okay. Um, my hope um, is for people to do the work, um, the daily work of taking care of themselves mentally, physically, and, um, and to have that positive attitude that we need on a daily basis to get us to the next day. Um, do get physical, get out. And, you know, during this time, don't just stay in the house cooped up and become depressed. Take that, take this time to, you know, get outside. Not with everybody still stay, you know, still <laughs> keep your distance, but, um, but know that a better day is coming and it, it, it'll be here soon. Yeah. I, one thing I think that hope is going to come out, my mom's been telling me to wash my hands and don't touch my face all my life. <laughs> Of course, that's after she licks the Kleenex and tries to clean that's clean my face. But anyways, um, so I think it's going to change the way a lot of people think about their health, about about the way they interact. But I also think that um, gratitude is going to be, I think, is a super um, healing thing. I think people are going to maybe hopefully get in touch, and I know I have with the things that I take for granted. Mm -hmm. and, when I go back out in my life, um, things and people and places and things I enjoy, you know, um, really be more mindful about those things and more appreciative. And that includes the environment too, for all, for that matter. So, um, but I, um, yeah, so I think there's going to be a lot of hope, you know, I think also, you know, for our first and second responders and stuff, I think we're going to have to appreciate people more and, and give them the respect they need, you know, um, when we see how they get us through this. Um, and I talk about, you know, first responders being, you know, our EMS, police, fire, and our second responders being the ones that are waiting in the emergency room to <laughs> take them in, you know, all the medical people. And then also like that grocery clerk that started crying. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think maybe how we'll connect differently as people. I mean, I noticed the other day on a walk too that, I was trying to smile and wave at people across the street and they were trying to run. Distancing <laughs> 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 has no eye contact and nothing. So that's okay. I didn't take it personal, but um, it's interesting. It is interesting. Um, so um, yeah, so anyways, that's all out of me. Thank you. It's good to see you guys. And um, everybody who's watching, they say peace to you. Yes, and then I think it is important to just appreciate, like you said, those first and those nurses and people on the front lines, those essential personnel, all the way from the fire police nurses to the liquor stores, which is interesting that they didn't close the liquor stores, but that's a whole other story. Um, and as we move on, that, 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 yeah, that's, a, that's another webinar. Um, but um, on the, I'm sorry. Hopefully we're able to do this again. Well, um, we, 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 we would like to, we want to do this. This was kind of an exercise for us. We wanted to try something, but uh, because we've had to cancel so many programs, you know, and that connection within the burn community is so incredibly important. And, and I want to take this opportunity publicly to, to just send to you and Jim both to thank you for saving my life. Because when I stumbled into the burn community, I thought I was a well-adjusted, normal person and found my tribe when I stepped into the burn community. And you guys just, you opened your arms and you embraced me and you allowed me to cry. You allowed me to feel how I feel. You allowed me to talk about things that I had never talked about before. You could tell me you knew what I was going through. And I knew you meant it because you'd been there. You know, I had, I heard that so much, but I knew people just cared. But what's interesting, that connection has been so important for me because we're all, the same. We're different, what we're the same. And this pandemic has everybody the same. It's impacting everybody. It doesn't matter your financial situation, your zip code, old, young, black, white. We're all in the same place now. And I'm just really, really hopeful and, and praying 
that we don't forget this. <laughs> you know, that we that we don't just all separate once we get on the other side of this. But on behalf of the Georgia Firefighters Burn Foundation, I mean, we're really about help, hope, and healing beyond the burn. But I can say it's about help, hope, and healing just in life, just getting on with life. And and I can't tell you how much it means that um, you guys took the time and energy and willingness to come on here and really share who you are. And we're hoping that someone, I don't know who this message was for, that someone found some some inspiration from it, because I certainly did. I, I, I did, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate you. Ben. Just know that we're going to move through this, and the world is going to be in a much better place when we get to the other side of this, You know, not despite it, but because of it. And thank you guys so much. And thank everyone who logged on. Uh, and this recording will be available on the Georgia Firefighters Burn Foundation website. But also, um, I'm hoping that we can put your contact information, Cindy, and what you're doing with your work and yours too, Jim. Even though I know you guys are overtaxed now, but um, just people having someone to reach out to. And we think these touch points, though it's virtual, uh, these touch points are really important. And hopefully this is the first of many. I'm happy to direct anybody to what's happening in there. I'm keep trying to keep touch of what's going on. So yes. I'm okay. happy to the support you need. I don't care who you are, just reach out. It's all good. Okay. Great. I would say the same thing. You know, we're never too busy. Never too okay. busy. So. Well, I appreciate you. Love you. And hopefully this will be the first of many. So we'll see what the responses are. And uh and we'll continue on this seven o'clock. And thank you guys so much. I love you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye.